protrusion uh, and the hard palate uh, that is called again porous palatinus. So this just means like a, it's just a bony protrusion, protrusion on the hard palate, so the small area. My mom has one too. She actually had a tooth. Yeah, some babies are born with that, and you want to have that removed. A tooth. Yeah, my boyfriend and they kept it. It's disgusting. Oh, lovely. <laughs> there were no teeth in them. <laughs> About a no normal variant is not going to cause a problem. <laughs> but you want to document that because then it proves that you actually looked in your variant. Well, right. So, however specific you can be in your notes, be realistic. Uh, that way, if there was any litigation and you went in and looked at your documentation, they say, oh, she is very thorough and she definitely looked and observed her heat because they noted this normal anomaly in this patient. Okay? Um, the uvula sometimes can be bifurcated, um, split, gone. They can have a uvulectomy from um, having a lot of posterior pharyngeal fullness and uh, that adds to uh, increased probability of sleep apnea, so they cut it out so that they're not having that uh, blockage of airway while they're sleeping. Call the uvula All right, you won't be tested on that. So again, now I'm looking at the teeth. I'm checking for missed teeth, summer, summer teeth, summer there, summer not. All of hers are present. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's uh, have cavities that were filled in the posterior molars, both upper and lower bilaterally. She has no broken or fractured teeth and no partials uh, that are removable. Um, I did not see any lesions, and of course, you can pull your lip down and show them on the uh, upper and lower mucosa of the. Ooh. You don't call these ladies, do you? Yeah, you do. Lips. To me, that almost sounds like I'm talking to the other part of the body. But they are your lips, okay. And um, and then if you will also, you can you have to lift your tongue up and move it from side to side. That way, you're not missing any lesions in the posterior thumb because when they automatically move it side to side, it also protrudes a little bit. So you're looking in all directions, okay? All right, that way you're not missing anything. We've done all that. That is the, did you guys see the? Mm -hmm. um, the tonsils are going to be in between the anterior and posterior pharyngeal walls or pillars. And, and most of the time, our age or, or greater, one, they've either been removed, and so then the anterior pillar is going to be almost opaque. Uh, scarred down, or not always. It could just be a normal uh, variation. Just note that people that have had their tonsils out can still get strep throat. It's not going to turn red because it's just like any scar. It's not going to change color. So just know that it doesn't always absolutely have to be red for them to have strep. But they've got all the symptoms and all the, the syndrome normal going on with the fever and the body aches and the headache and the flu is negative and they're complaining that the throat is killing them uh, or they've got the spotted tongue, all the other symptoms. Go ahead and swap them. Uh, but you're going to note uh, tonsils have atrophy due to age or have had a post uh, tonsillectomy. Okay. Uh, the other thing that I always document on my pharyngeal uh, examination is that posterior pharynx is patent. Because if you do have an infection, then you would want to note whether or not they've got exudate, enlarged tonsils to be 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, one more than the other, so unilateral. Uh, um, edema on the right being 2 plus and left being 1 plus, no uvular deviation, and patent airway still, so that you know that you're documenting that when you saw them, that way if they continue to have edema and get into trouble, that they were fine when you saw them. All right. <clears throat> they are going to tell, teach you being um, Professor Brooks and uh, um, Rourke. Rourke? She says we're work, so I'm trying to I'm trying to relearn that. Yes, the uh, lymphatic uh, examination, which is extremely important when you're having uh, throat infections and that, but it's not part of our uh, lecture today. I just want to make that a huge point so that you don't think they don't go together. Okay. So anytime I'm examining the mouth and the throat, I'm examining the lymph nerves and the neck as well. All right. Moving right along, that was. <coughs> Head, eyes, nose, throat. 
and now to the ears, last but not least. So, again, first thing to do is an inspection. They don't make their own. On the outside, so I've already looked at the level of her ears and that. Now I'm just going to check the external behind and the shape and making sure does that hurt when I touch or tug on that and the other one as well. Uh, I don't see any lesions, abnormalities, or growths that should not be there. Again, um, this is the positioning. And I tug and pull out and place the speculum in and then look. So I place it in where I want to be and go the depth pretty much and then look. And then if I need to get behind cerumen or hair or anything, then I move it accordingly, but very little. Can you guys see mm -hmm. as far as the movement? See how little that movement is? And I'm able to see every structure. So now I'm going to do it on this side since this arm is not going to be in your way. And I'm going to say what you should be saying. All right? So placement there. <clears throat> on this ear, she has a little bit of cerumen in the uh, external auditory canal that I'm actually able to see past that. It is not occluding. I see the cone of light being appropriate. Uh, there is no fluid or bulging of the ear canal. I do not have any subcalation bulb. I did not find one. That's what took me so long to get over here. Um, but if I did have one, it would hook in here and then. I would have it sitting here with my fingers on it like this. And I would go or and let go. Um, they shouldn't have a lot of pain. You'll let them know I'm going to blow a little bit of air into your ear so that I can see if you're taking anything right moves. Yes. Well, we have one of those old store that's the be awesome. There's not one over there. I don't so think so. Not. I think they had them. Uh, last year, didn't they have them close their nose and, you know, do that to... Yeah, that's how that I remember it, but I could be wrong. Um, sorry, honestly... Oh, cool. Yeah. She's got one. Oh, so. um, I know they use them a lot with specialties, but as you get better, and it's really a beginner's thing, as you get better, you'll be able to see fluid. You'll be able to see fluid bubbles, and you'll be able to know that it's bulging versus not. Uh, there was no discoloration, no fluid behind the tympanic membrane, no discoloration of the tympanic membrane itself. There was no perforations, and the cone of light was an appropriate placement. Um, the external auditory canal was clear on the left, but had a little bit of cerumen uh, that I could maneuver around on the right, so it did not require for me to maneuver back to the be able to see. Now, uh, the specialty test of the ear. <coughs> So, Weber's and Renee's. Again, so the um, very gross assessment as far as auditory acuity uh, is going to be the rub test or the whisper test. Um, so, tell me what you can hear. this part of it even, it's going to stop it, okay? So, 
make sure that you've got your fingers down as far as you can away from the forking area. All right. So again, you're just going to clang it and put it centrally on your head. Can you hear it equally? Yes, sometimes. Probably appropriate for your hand to be this way to where my hand's not blocking. But it's bone connect conduction, so it shouldn't matter. All right, so that's the weather. Again, should be equal bilaterally on both sides. And that is the vibration, not necessarily the sound. Okay. Now the Renee, again, banging it, placing it. You feel the vibration right here? You tell me when it goes away. Can you hear it now? Yes. <laughs> it stops. I'll do it a little bit harder. But then that, then you have to. Wait, 